Mr. President, distinct members of the IOC, it would be a tremendous honor for us to host the Games in 2020 in Tokyo. One of the safest cities in the world, now and in 2020. Some may have concerns about Fukushima. Let me assure you, the station is under control. And you don't believe we're on the eve of destruction. And the conversation came around to world events and that New Zealand was still a nuclear-free country. And she then mentioned the radiation cloud that was first noticed off the Australian coast of Caloundra back in early January of this year, and that another one was measured over Dunedin, New Zealand, following that. It being perceived that this was one and the same radiation cloud. I said yes, I was very aware of this radiation cloud across Caloundra and had previously sent the only news article available to Pam and that when it happened, it irked me that radiation had entered the southern hemisphere to the extent that a very good naturopath I knew had advised me on detoxing radiation a number of days previously. She then said that she actually lived opposite the guy in Caloundra who first raised the alarm when his Geiger counter spiked up to eight microservits back on the 8th of January in 2012. I immediately said yes, I wanted to talk to him and the next day visited Peter Daly, an IT specialist who was adept at computers and monitoring certain technologies. Peter then conveyed that things were indeed very serious and that the global media and governments worldwide, including Australia and New Zealand, were playing everything down. They have been censoring a huge percentage about Fukushima radiation contamination. So due to the fact that I have found myself in a profound synchronistic event, I feel it is my duty to tell the public at large, locally and globally, that we have a challenge, that we need to find solutions and work towards this as a conscious, caring community. On the phone from Caloundra, on the Sunshine Coast, I have Peter Daly, who is a specialist in computers, but also has an interest in taking Geiger counter readings of what is in the atmosphere. On the 8th of January of this year, he measured a radiation spike on his Geiger counter that sent alarm bells in his reality. And this radiation is said to be as a result of Fukushima radiation from Japan being able to cross the equatorial region from the northern hemisphere and into the southern hemisphere. What is of concern to us here in New Zealand is that this radiation cloud then carried on across the Tasman Sea, crossing the South Island and being picked up by Geiger counters in Dunedin. And that other than the alternative press covering it, it was ignored and at worst censored by mainstream media. So this is very, very potent, Peter, and I wish to say kia ora and thank you for coming onto the radio today. Thank you, Tim, for inviting me onto this show to talk. Peter, can you explain to the audience, in your own words, what happened back on that day in January? Well, it was a very hot, windy day. The wind was coming from the northeast. The evening around 6.30, I was down the back end of the house, and I wandered up and walked into the computer room, and Linda was sitting there, and she was complaining. She said, look, there's an alarm going off. Would you turn that alarm off? And I was thinking, what alarm's that? And then I realised it was a Geiger counter who was sitting on the bench and the alarm was going off, which pretty well shocked me and had been obviously going off for a while. I picked it up and started to look at it and it peaked at 0.8 microservits per hour, which is eight times our normal background here. Now, the interesting thing, it could have gone a lot higher than that, but I only reported what I saw because a Geiger counter is data logging mode and records every 10 minutes. So you have to get a visual viewing to see the peaks that may be coming through that the data logging will miss. I see. And what happened then? Well, then, actually, I started to ring all my friends and tell them that there's a radioactive cloud coming through and they should actually go inside and shut the windows. Um, this really totally surprised me. I actually had bought a Geiger counter because I realised the Fukushima nuclear disaster was much worse than we were being told. And I felt from the evidence that I've been looking at on the internet coming through 2011 
that a lot of radioactivity had spread through the Northern Hemisphere. Now, I'm in the IT business, and I get equipment from all over the world. So I bought the Geiger counter to test all the boxes coming through. I envisage that sometime after 12 months, we may be able to detect some radioactivity leaking through for the Northern Hemisphere, and that was the other reason I bought the Geiger counter. But January was about three months earlier than I expected it, so it was a real shock to me. As a continuation of this, Peter, what other action did you take? Well, eventually I contacted a local newspaper and they actually did a story on it in the, what's called the Sunshine Coast Daily, which is our local paper, and took some pictures and wrote up about the radioactive cloud that I detected. Now, the cloud peaked at 0.8 microservice per hour, but the entire cloud lasted for about three hours and passing over. We actually contacted the nuclear regulatory organisation here, or I should say the paper did, and spoke to them, and as usual, they said it was harmless and nothing to worry about. They also said they felt it was caused by possibly a rain event, or equally it could be caused by some local hospital or something releasing radiation. Well, interestingly enough, I had taken wind directions on the day, and I'm pretty close to the Pacific Ocean, so if it was a hospital, it would have had been in the Pacific Ocean. And besides, I hope hospitals aren't releasing that sort of radiation into the atmosphere. Very true. And as a result, did you then hear about the radiation cloud that went over the South Island of New Zealand? Well, what happened because of that article is it set up interest all over the world. And then I had contact from a gentleman in New Zealand who said, in response to my article, he also had a Geiger counter and it was located in Dunedin. And he did a bit of a swab of some rain that was on his car and found that he had high levels of radiation, which were mildly higher than normal background. But then, a short period after that, he also then contacted me and said, wow, it's Sunday afternoon and I'm getting these spikes of radiation coming through. He said, I stepped out into the street and my Geiger counter was showing 1.89 microservits per hour. Now, this particular person says he has a background in the nuclear industry, and he said he was totally shocked. And this was a free air measurement, which is pretty significant. So he quickly ran inside and shut all the windows and doors. But that wasn't the end of it. He got that detection on the 29th of the 1st. That was a few weeks later. And then a couple of days after that, at 2 o'clock in the morning, he got another detection coming over Dunedin and his visual observation on that was that it went up to 4.5 microservits per hour, which really shocked us because as far as we were concerned, New Zealand was one of the safest places on the planet if you had a nuclear disaster. And they get these sort of spikes and readings from New Zealand and particularly the South Island of New Zealand and Dunedin was a real shock to all the people who were taking notice of all this. Very true, solely because Dunedin is in rain shadow to a degree that the Southern Alps, which sort of peak at 10,000 feet or 3,000 metres nearly, usually stops rain from coming across and Dunedin is in that particular area. The radiation, is, of course, is far higher than the mountains. It's obviously in the jet stream but also falling down to ground level. It all actually happens when you get high-level radiation up in the jet streams. When you get rain or snow events, it can draw it out of the jet stream and drop it on to wherever it's falling. And this can create what are called hot spots. That means that you may get a rain event in your location, but the rain or snow may not have fallen 5 or 10 kilometres away, and they may be quite safe. So all this radioactivity in the higher atmosphere when it comes down in a weather event, can create hot spots all over the place. And we think this is what happened in Dunedin. That rain event actually dropped some of that radioactivity onto the environment. Because we haven't heard anything from the so-called government or the departments relating to radiation or any scientific review whatsoever. So it's a shock to us to hear this and know that... You'll find, this is a, you'll find this is a scenario all over the world. People with 
Geiger counters are detecting abnormal levels of radioactivity in their environments. A lot of them aren't reporting it for fear of ridicule, but there are some that are willing to step up and say, yes, I detected this. And what we're finding is they're usually very high amounts, sometimes for very short periods of time, but they are significant. Now, one of the interesting things is that no one was really expecting these high levels of radioactive detection to be happening in the Southern Hemisphere. Just be aware that I'm not the only one who detected radiation in Australia. There is a gentleman at Byron Bay who was detecting high levels and another gentleman in Melbourne who detected high levels of radiation fallout as well. Also, I've heard in New Zealand there are other people at the same time who had Geiger counters who detected extra levels of radiation coming through. But again, they have not publicised that fact. Yes, it's disturbing. And Peter, when we look at the bigger picture and go up to Fukushima in Japan, the situation in there is getting out of hand? Well, I think the thing to bring across to most people is that the Fukushima nuclear disaster is much worse than they've been told. You've got multiple nuclear reactors have melted down and multiple fuel pools that have contained multiple old reactor cores have been vaporised or still exposed to the atmosphere. The Fukushima melted down reactor cores and exposed fuel pools are still sending huge amounts of radiation to the atmosphere and it's over 12 months now. And then this hasn't stopped. What you've got here is a situation where enormous amounts of radiation have been released from this industrial disaster. Lucky for Japan in one way, because of the jet stream and weather condition, most of it ended up in the Pacific Ocean. If that hadn't happened, Japan would be probably uninhabitable now. The other interesting thing is the negative side of it going to that jet stream that heads towards America is that it goes over the Pacific Ocean. So a large area of the Pacific Ocean has been contaminated with high levels of radioactivity. But also eastern Russia, Alaska... The west coast of Canada and America and northern Mexico have areas that have been highly contaminated with radioactive fallout. A lot of people have the misconception that it's just confined to Japan, but it isn't. If you look at the weather simulations of where the fallout is gone, most people would be absolutely shocked. Some of that radiation has blown back onto Tokyo, and there are different places in Tokyo that have hot spots. I mean, there's interesting... I've seen lots of people with private Geiger counters and detectors putting up videos on YouTube, etc., of very high detection, 4, 5, 9, 10 microservits per hour of radiation in different places around Tokyo and surround. Now, to put this into perspective, our normal background radiation, say, here in Australia and New Zealand, would be, say, 0.1 microservit per hour. So when you get something like 4.5 or high, you're talking 45 times nine microservice per hour is 90 times our normal background. In Japan, you've got men, women and children living in amongst this. They should be evacuated. A lot of these areas that are getting these high detections are outside the so-called exclusion zones. And to me, it's criminal uh, living, particularly children, living in these areas that are highly contaminated. You have to understand that children are much more sensitive to radioactive contamination as a group. And in that group, young girls are five times more sensitive than young boys. So they should be evacuated immediately and should have been evacuated immediately. This disaster happened from these contaminated areas. You've got playgrounds and kindergartens and school grounds that are highly contaminated. And you've got these children still attending school and kindergarten there. It's just criminal. And they're breathing this in and they're also drinking it in the water? Well, what actually I need to clear up for people is the idea of how radioactivity can affect them. If there's a piece of radioactivity, let's say you have a piece of uranium on a desk in your room and it's emitting radiation. Let's say you're a metre away from that. That's not good, but it's not necessarily going to affect you if you move away or leave the room in the long term. If you double the distance, say, now move two metres away from it, you quarter the amount of radiation that you're 
exposed to. But on another level, if you bring that radioactivity closer to you, that means then the radioactivity that you're being exposed to dramatically increases. So the real danger with radioactivity is ingested radiation from contaminated food and liquids or air, because once you ingest it, it gets very close to your body cells and radiates your body cells with high doses of radiation for long periods of time. And the thing with that is you can't walk away from it. It's there inside you and you can't remove it through just walking away. So ingested radiation coming through in radioactive clouds and contaminated food or liquids, water, etc., is highly dangerous. And this is the trouble with Japan. A lot of people are ingesting the radioactivity. It's just not in the ground outside where they're walking. It's in their food, it's in their water, it's in their air. And a lot of these people have been exposed to quite enormous amounts of radioactivity. I'll give you an example. Recently I saw a post by someone who taken a dosimeter into Tokyo Station. And they measured up to 6.5 microserverts per hour, which is six times our, 65 times our normal background, or 10 times the level of which they evacuated parts of Chernobyl. But there's up to 3,000 trains a day going through there, and countless numbers of people walking through this. So this radioactivity isn't in the structure of the building, it's in the dust in the air that's been stirred up by people moving through. This also indicates that there are a lot of people coming from contaminated areas, bringing it in on their shoes and feet, etc., and it's been dropped in a deposit in that hub. Yeah, it's quite frightful, really, because the Japanese people are being left as guinea pigs, and that's not a nice statement to make. But essentially, you have got a people, a whole country, who uh, are nearly sort of transfixed in not being able to make any major shifts because to move 33 million people out of Tokyo down south, it's just a huge, impossible logistical exercise. Well, really, my opinion about that is there should be a worldwide effort. There should have been a worldwide effort at the beginning to deal with this disaster. It shouldn't have been just left to the Japanese. I mean, if everything was put in place, you could have evacuated those people. It could have been done. It just had to have the will behind it to do it. But as far as I'm concerned, it would appear, all the evidence suggests that the powers that be, and that's all the world governments, decided to leave these people there to keep the economy and the system functioning as normal. The thing with radioactivity is it won't necessarily kill you straight away. It can take years before the illness manifests. The other thing a lot of people don't realise is that different isotopes have different effects on the body. It won't necessarily cause cancer. It can cause other problems as well. Each radioactive isotope has different chemical affinities in the body. Strontium is like calcium, so it goes to the bone. Cesium gets absorbed into the muscles, and particularly the heart. Plutonium is similar to iron and gets through the circulatory system. So you have different isotopes affect different parts of the body and can cause different problems. For instance, cesium can get into the heart and people can be quite healthy and all of a sudden they can suffer a heart attack and die because it causes the heart to malfunction. So there's lots of these things that people aren't aware of about these isotopes. The other thing is a lot of these isotopes besides being radioactive and can be radioactively toxic. They're also heavy metals, so they can also be chemically toxic like mercury or lead. So you sort of get a double whammy from them. The other thing that they talk about is, when they talk about radioactivity and isotopes, is what they call half-lives. For instance, a lot of radioactive iodine was released in the first stages of this disaster, which spread over Japan and also over Alaska, northern Canada and western America and they say it only has a half-life of eight days which is true but its toxicity takes ten times longer so it's really an environmental problem for ten times that or eighty days. Cesium has a half-life of thirty years 
that means you multiply that by 10. So it's 300 years in the environment that it actually can be toxic to the human biological system and the environment. The other thing is a lot of these isotopes, radioactive isotopes in the environment, bioaccumulate through the food chain. So even though they might give a report and say, oh, look, all the cesium fell in the Pacific Ocean and we've done measurements and it's really small amounts, they don't follow through and then tell you that U.S. Navy studies have shown that fish at the end of the food chain can concentrate this radioactivity up to 100,000 times. So they make out that it's not an issue, but in actual fact it is an issue if you follow through and do your research. I would strongly suggest that all the listeners here today get on the internet and do private research in this matter. Websites to go to to get really good up-to-date information are E-N-E News, E-N-E-N-E-W-S dot com. Are E-N-E News, E-N-E-N-E-W-S dot com. And they'll be shocked about the information they're given there that they're not given by the mainstream press or the nuclear industry. Can I move over a little bit? You mentioned that the Japanese ambassador to Switzerland has jumped ship and has decided to go to the public at large or go to the world governmental bodies to say that what's happening in Fukushima is so frightening that we have to get countries to come together and that the Japanese, they cannot wait around to find a way to save face. But in actual fact, we need all the brilliance of the world's scientists to come together and solve this problem because of what's happening. Now, could you explain about this ambassador and what he did? Yeah, I should probably give a little bit more background first before I go there about the structure of Fukushima. You have four nuclear reactor buildings there. Most people would have seen three of them blow up. Now, what happened then in a short period afterwards is that the fuel rods melted down and created a really hot blob at the bottom of the containment vessels. Within a short period of time of those explosions, those blobs melted out of the stainless steel payments into the dry well underneath. Now, from the Nuclear Registry Commission's own documents, they say when you get a meltdown like that in the dry well concrete underneath, it melts through at about two inches an hour. So within a very short period of time, these blobs have melted through the concrete. Now, while they're doing that, there have been releasing enormous amounts of radiation and the only way they can control that is to constantly pump lots of water onto it. This water has been evaporating, radioactive water, lots of it evaporating up into the higher atmosphere and going up into the jet stream. Depending on the weather conditions heading towards America and Canada, Alaska, etc., or if it swings around over the rest of Japan, Korea, northern China, etc. Now, this has been going on for over 12 months now. And when they pour that water on, because these containments are all broken, it's like pouring water into a cracked bowl. It's seeping out all into the environment, into the ocean. It's horrendous. But besides that, all these nuclear reactors had spent fuel pools sitting above them, like a giant swimming pool. What they do is they take the cores out of the reactors, this is the old cores out of the reactors, and they put them into these spent fuel pools to cool down. This happens worldwide. Now, legally, they're only supposed to keep a reactor core in each pool one at a time. But all around the world, all the utilities have been stacking multiple old cores into these fuel pools. So these are sitting there up in Fukushima about 30 metres or 100 feet above the ground. Some of them were just vaporised and blown into the atmosphere. Others are sitting there slowly deteriorating. And spent fuel pool 4 in particular, where the reactor wasn't actually on at the time, but they had a lot of old spent fuel pools stored in the pool. It cracked and started to leak. And what's actually happened then is that it's all these fuel pools, including spent fuel pool, have been releasing enormous amounts of radioactivity into the atmosphere. Now, what's particularly dangerous is spent fuel pool for because it has so many fuel rods in it. It has about 1,535 fuel rods sitting in this cooling pool. 
in a building that has been blown apart and is rickety and is leaning. What they've done is got underneath the pool and reinforced it as best they can with steel posts and jacks and tried to seal up all the leaks. But because Japan is such a seismically active zone, if there was a significant earthquake that cracked the pool or caused it to topple, all these fuel pool rods would then fall and be exposed to the atmosphere. If that happened, the amount of radiation released would be so bad that no human or robot could get into the nuclear reactor Fukushima area and do the remedial work that needs to be done to keep this all under control. It would release enormous amounts of radiation above what's already been released. The word is by all the experts that they would definitely have to evacuate Tokyo if this happened. It should be evacuated now, but if this happened, they'd have no choice. It could be a world changer. The amount of radiation going through the jet stream and then ending up in America or in the Pacific Ocean would be enormous. This is what this former Japanese ambassador is talking about. He says if this happens, it could be the end of civilization as we know it. But there's a cultural problem. The Japanese don't want to lose face. They would want to be seen to be in control of it. But he's been ranks and basically said, look, this is beyond us. This is so urgent. We need as much international help as we can possibly get to deal with it right now because the whole health of the planet is at stake and it's beyond our pride. We have to ask for help. And he's taken it to the United Nations. Yes, he's taken it to the head of the United Nations. He wrote him an open letter to say this is extremely serious and something needs to be done about it. He also presented it at the recent conference they had in Korea dealing with nuclear terrorism. The funny thing about this, I saw a post by, I think, one of the Japanese citizens. He said, look, all we need to happen is for some nuclear terrorists to come over here with a broom and a dustpan and they'll be able to get as much nuclear material as they like to create a, a nuclear dirty bomb, which is pretty horrible. I agree. Now, Peter, there was also an investigative reporter who flew around America researching and taking a Geiger counter and taking radiation readings. This is the environmental reporter. This is a gentleman in America who set up a radioactive monitoring station in California. But the environmental reporter in late December went on a plane trip across America and he took his Geiger counter with him and also some filter masks, which would have looked a bit strange on the aircraft. But anyhow, while he was up in the higher atmosphere and measuring with his Geiger counter, the Geiger counter went to 36 times normal background radiation. Now, people will say to that, well, when you get up in an aircraft and get in the higher atmosphere, it goes up higher to normal background anyhow. That is true. And anyone travelling in the higher atmosphere in an aircraft before Fukushima would have been exposed to four or five times normal background on the ground. But this was 36 times normal background which meant that the aircraft had to be flying through a radioactive cloud coming from Fukushima and it was being sucked into the actual cockpit. Now remember, radioactive particulate matter that's really dangerous, which means this air that was sucked into the cockpit had to have lots of hot particles in it. So when they got back to the ground, they got their special filter masks and put their Geiger counter against it and found that it elevated levels of radioactivity which means that the mask had filtered out hot particles out of the aircraft cabin air that had been sucked in. Now, people aren't being told this. I'm not saying that's every time you fly, but when that jet stream is coming from Japan and there's another radioactive event at Fukushima, it can have high amounts of radioactivity in the atmosphere, higher atmosphere. Now, when it comes to Bakersfield... Bakersfield is, I think, the eighth largest city in California. I managed to get a screenshot of one of their monitoring stations there and it was reading the beta count type of radiation in the atmosphere. And during December, January, it was going off the chart. Now, this chart was measuring what's called counts per minute. So if you're looking about how normal background is 
12.1 microsieverts per hour. That equates to about 12 counts per minute. So this was going about 80 times our normal background and off the chart. So that was enormous amounts of radiation that these people were subjected to. Now, really, the government should have been telling people how to protect themselves and their families and their children. This should be a worldwide government process is to educate people what they should be doing to protect their families and their children from this fallout. And most of it's in the northern hemisphere at present and even though we've got detections in the southern hemisphere which isn't good. Some places like North America, particularly the west coast, a lot of the cities and environs through there have actually had enormous amounts of radioactive fallout coming and falling from Fukushima onto their environment. And they've been breathing it in, drinking the water, eating the food that's contaminated. And most of them are in complete ignorance and haven't been told. They're even told that the radiation from Japan wouldn't affect North America. And to be quite honest, it's an outright lie. I'm speaking with Peter Daly from Caloundra on the Sunshine Coast in Australia. And he was the person who noted a spike from his Geiger counter when a radiation cloud came over the particular area, which we presume comes from the Fukushima nuclear plant in Japan. This cloud carried on down the coast of Australia, over the Tasman Sea, towards New Zealand, and crossed over Dunedin. And the main thing is, the Australian nor the New Zealand public were advised of this, and precautions taken. Because the top experts in fuel pools, Dr. Robert Alvarez, he's a former senior policy advisor to the Secretary and Deputy Assistant Secretary for National Security and Environment of the US Department of Energy, was actually asked for an explanation of the potential impact of the 11,421 rods that are exposed and the shocking reply came back from him was it was far worse and to the degree that they're not saying anything about it. That's correct and this is morally wrong as far as I'm concerned. They should be informing people how to protect themselves and evacuating people from the most affected areas but they tended to keep everyone in the quiet and not informed and it's only people who've taken the time and effort to get out on the internet and did private research that they've discovered the real situation and how serious it is i'm actually informing friends and relatives at the present time to only eat local food and not to travel except to stay local because a lot of this contamination is going to be bioaccumulated in areas where this has fallen into the environment and when that happens, it means it's going to get into food that comes from the Northern Hemisphere. I mean, it has to get into the fish. It has to get into the dairy. It has to get into the meat. I mean, you have to understand the way this works. Let's say you have an acre of land that you're grazing cows on that's been contaminated with radioactive fallout. And they go along and vacuum up that land, eating all the grass. They've actually concentrated that fallout into their biological system and then that cow is slaughtered or the milk and uh, you drink the milk or you eat the meat and therefore you ingest the ingested radioactive contamination that's bioaccumulated in those animals and that goes for fish as well so really this is really awful to the health and well-being of the human population but isn't also very deadly to all those other creatures that live on the planet that we share the planet with. The other thing to understand with all this radioactivity bioaccumulating and if you ingest it, it can seriously affect your health in years to come. It may not kill you straight away, but what it will do is shorten your lifespan. Now, if you're an elderly person, it may not be that great concern because you're getting towards the end of your lifespan anyhow. But if you've got children or grandchildren and they're affected by this. It could affect their lifespans and shorten it by 50, 60 years or so. And the other thing is this contamination causes gene damage. And what they have discovered, the research has been done by a lot of Russian scientists in Chernobyl, is a lot of this gene damage 
would be expressed in maybe one generation later. But the recent studies are showing no, it's expressed through multiple generations. So we're looking at a disaster here that is not going to just affect us, but it will also affect numerous generations in the future, not only in the human population, but also in all the other creatures that share this planet with us. You see, the information that I have on the US Energy Department data states that the fuel rods and the radioactivity is equivalent to roughly 85 times the amount of cesium-137 released at the Chernobyl incident. You have to understand that the Chernobyl incident this is a major one. There was one reactor and they had it relatively in control in two weeks. In Japan, who have multiple nuclear reactors that have melted down. They haven't been brought under control. It's been going for over 13 months now. During this period of time, those reactors have been releasing enormous amounts of radiation, including cesium, plus all the fuel pools that have been damaged and are open to the atmosphere have also been doing that. So you just don't have three reactor cores that are releasing radiation. You have literally tens of reactor cores releasing radiation. Now, the Japanese have around 54 nuclear reactors. After this disaster, they started to shut them down. At the present time, I think they've only got one nuclear reactor working. So it's been a real shock to their system. They've pretty well, at this stage, shut down every nuclear reactor in the country. But this still has not stopped the disaster. The disaster is ongoing. They need technology, which we don't have right now, to deal with it. We're in a gridlock. We're in actual fact, we need to have this discussion. It has to be out there in the public domain and we need to be empowering our leaders to get our top scientists and anybody else to assist the government of Japan and if it means forcing ourselves nearly onto the picture we've got to find a way to negotiate our way in of course but this is serious what's happening in Japan is affecting the whole world I mean all the radioactive detections by myself and others just in the southern hemisphere and the numerous ones in the Northern Hemisphere indicate that something major is happening and we're not being told the truth. We also have now this former ambassador breaking ranks and saying this is a world-changing serious event. It's going to affect everyone. We need help. We should be calling upon the entire international community to help us. To get about our pride and saving face, we have no choice. So you've got at the present time, spent fuel pool four, sitting 30 metres, 100 feet above the ground, and in a building that's been heavily damaged by an explosion. It's got cracks and leaks, and the only thing keeping it up at present are these steel rods that they put in to reinforce and hold it up. But you have to understand the enormous amounts of weights of the fuel pools and the water in the fuel pool, and how that can easily be destroyed by a major earthquake nearby. Now, around the 14th or 15th of this month, April, they had 20 earthquakes centred around Fukushima in 24 hours. The largest one was about 5.9. But even that stopped their cooling system from working, and at one stage they were losing cooling systems within that reactor core spent fuel pool and it wasn't looking very good but if they get a major earthquake of significance seven or above the whole thing could topple if that happens we then have a situation that is far more dangerous than it is now and there may be no way people can actually get in there and get control of it i'd like to emphasize that it hasn't fallen yet but we certainly need an international effort to get control of the situation. Like you say, we need all those bright minds to get in there and brainstorm solutions to all the problems they're facing at Fukushima. At Chernobyl, of course, there were many 
courageous people there who threw their life on the line and they had helicopters come over and entombed Chernobyl by dropping cement from these helicopters to lock down. And, of course, the helicopter people all lost their lives. And the only difficulty, of course, is Fukushima is so close to the water to the ocean, it's nearly impossible to do all this because even when they endeavour to entomb the cooling towers, the water's going to splash over and it's going to be all over the place. It's, it's a dreadful situation. The thing to understand is with Fukushima, the Fukushima reactor is spread over a much larger area and you also have the situation where the buildings have completely blown apart and the blobs of molten core material have melted down through the concrete. They don't actually know where these molten blobs of highly reactive material from the cores are. They get close enough to find out. So they're like radioactive volcanoes continually releasing enormous amounts of radioactivity into the atmosphere. Now just be aware, there are a lot of very brave Japanese men have risked their lives and probably died dealing with this disaster. This just hasn't been publicised. A lot of people jump up and say, oh, well, no one's died at Fukushima. That is total nonsense. I've seen a letter, which is correspondence, an email between the NRC and the Japanese. It's been posted on the internet. It clearly states within the first day or so that the Japanese reported that five workers had been exposed to lethal doses of radiation. Also, a lot of people have looked at the death statistics in North America and Japan, and they estimate that approximately up to 54,000 Americans have died as a result of Fukushima and up to 44,000 Japanese. So what they're doing is looking at the old statistical records of deaths and expected death rates before Fukushima and then after Fukushima. The thing with radiation is if someone dies from it, how do you prove it? And this is one of the things with any of these disasters. They will say that the death wasn't because of the radiation. You can look at that Chernobyl. If you go up to Wikipedia and look up deaths there from Chernobyl, you'll say, oh, so they estimate up to 33,000. But if you look at the research done by the actual Russians, and that research has recently been translated into English, they estimate over the last 25 years close to a million people, men, women and children, have died as a result of Chernobyl. So this is the thing you face with. Whenever you get people in the industry talking, they always play it down. They're like people in the tobacco industry. They will always play down the hazards relating to their industry. If you get independent researchers to have the communities at heart, they tell the truth. So when I'm doing research, I always look for independent researchers who have no vested interest in an industry, whether it's successful or not. They're only interested in what effect it has on the community. And they report truthfully what their findings are. Peter, we come from Nuclear Free New Zealand. And... It was a great battle to get over a hundred local areas to become nuclear free, which then gave the government a mandate to bring about a nuclear free country because they realised that New Zealanders wanted that. Well, unfortunately, if you've got countries all over the world that have got nuclear reactors and, and they can go into meltdown, no one eventually is nuclear free. We actually have to have a worldwide movement to shut down all the nuclear reactors. A lot of people don't realise how many nuclear reactors there are in the world. There are actually about 442 nuclear reactors for generating electricity. There's another 250 around the world for research purposes. And the rest up to around 1,000 are military. So you've got 442 for generating electricity, 250 for research reactors, and the rest, up to 1,000, are all military. Now, PAN has 54 nuclear reactors. 
all these plants are built in a highly seismically active zone, which is just crazy. So the thing to understand is that really you can have a nuclear-free country, which is great, but if your neighbour has nuclear reactors and an accident happens, you're no longer nuclear-free. It can affect you. It can affect your children and it can affect generations to come. And this is what we're seeing in Fukushima, in Japan. Look how far Japan is from Canada, Alaska and North America. And yet the radioactivity from there has seriously affected the west coast of America, Canada and Alaska and the people living there. And of course there's the animals. And it's really interesting because from Caloundra you have godwits that fly up to Japan, into Siberia and Alaska, and also in New Zealand. They also fly from Alaska for five days, five to seven days, non-stop down to New Zealand. Now, these godwits are in many ways now the canaries in the coal mine, aren't they? Well, a lot of these uh, migratory animals, whether they be bird, fish or animal, are being affected by the radioactivity fallout that's in the atmosphere but also in the ocean. So a lot of fish, migratory fish, are swimming through the highly contaminated zones of the Pacific Ocean and moving to different other areas as well. I mean, there are reports of a mysterious illness in walruses, turtles and polar bears along the west coast of Canada and Alaska. They say it isn't radioactive fallout that's causing that. But a lot of people are suspicious about that. One of the things to understand about radioactive contamination is it can affect the immune system and all living things on the planet. So if your immune system is weakened, diseases that would normally not affect you can seriously affect you and cause death. And a lot of these animals have probably have very compromised immune systems at present. Very true. What is the suggestion for listeners to do in relationship to eating healthy? Do they well, go and get what we've got iodine? Iodine is an important thing to take in certain circumstances, but not all circumstances. My suggestion is that for your family's health and well-being, we all collectively need to demand, we need to collectively demand that the air, food, water and goods be tested that are coming from contaminated areas. If we don't demand it, it won't happen. So we have to get our governments to do the testing. One of the things you have to understand is that to detect some of this radioactive material in food and water, etc., you need highly sophisticated instrumentation and the skills to use it. We really need governments to start doing that. But that hasn't been happening because the governments won't admit that there's anything really seriously happening here. So my suggestion is do research. To find out what are the most contaminated areas. Make sure you do not purchase food from those areas. Buy food that's local, that's grown local. Educate the family that's what they should be doing. And when it comes to travel, I suggest you restrict all your travel at the present time to the Southern Hemisphere. Research dietary systems that can help remove and protect your body and your, your family from radioactive contamination. There's lots of dietary supplements and things you can take that will help remove heavy metal contamination from the system. And a lot of these radioactive isotopes are heavy metals. I don't want to say very good, Peter. All I can say is thank you very much for sharing. You have been very lucid, and I feel that you have conveyed a very, very clear message that needs to be adhered to, that listeners need to say, right, I've got to commit myself now to taking care of myself, my family, and my community, and also enabling our government to be far more involved because as a nuclear-free country, New Zealand has been really, really complacent over the last so many years 
It is time for us to be really, really serious if we love our children and our grandchildren. And we need to move now. I agree. Everyone has to become proactive. You've got to get out there and do your research. Educate yourself about radiation and how it affects the environment and the human biological system. Learn about remedial things you can do to protect your family, including food and dietary systems you can put in place to help remove contamination from the body. And remember, avoid buying and purchasing food from radioactive contaminated areas. And that could be a bit of a moving target. So you've got to get out there and stay on top of it and do your research and find websites that keep you up to date. Peter, thank you very much for sharing with us here in New Zealand. And I trust elsewhere that people will get motivated now to recognise that we are on this planet. We are all one humanity and we cannot run away from this. We have to face it and get stuck in. Yeah, thank you very much, Tim, for inviting me on your radio program. It's very appreciated. Excellent, Pete. Thank you so much. That was Peter Daly from Caloundra in Australia talking about the radiation spike that he first noticed on the 8th of January 2012 and then what cascaded into something far greater to make us really become aware that we have one of the greatest challenges facing the human race happening right now. And enenews.com, E-N-E-news.com.